Howdy, my name is Luz Herrera. I'm a professor and associate dean at Texas A&M University School of Law. Welcome to uh, the, the Leadership Mentoring the Next Generation webinar. It is uh, the third installment of our Spring 2021 TAMU Law Answers, Conversations in Law and Social Justice. So the, this is part of a, a webinar series. We have three additional webinars that are coming up and they happen every other Thursday at noon central time. The webinars that are coming up, the next one is gonna be on justice for immigrant youth, an update on family separation. I know there's a lot of interest uh, in this issue. Also training social justice lawyers today. And then the final installment for this uh, semester will be farm worker employment justice. And so we look forward to seeing you there. You can register for these upcoming webinars at tam tamulawanswers.info. And you can also see uh, past webinars um, that are recorded and saved on that same website. Today's webinar is co-sponsored by the Texas A&M School of Law, the Network for Justice, which is part of the American Bar Foundation's Future of Latinos in the US project, and the American Bar Association's Commission on Hispanic Legal Rights and Responsibilities. I have the great pleasure of introducing our moderator and uh, our organizer for today's panel, distinguished professor of law, Rachel Moran. She is at UC Irvine School of Law, and she will go ahead and introduce the rest of the panelists. But before I hand it over to her, I want to uh, make a couple of announcements. Um, some of the panelists are our attorneys. We're not gonna be really discussing legal issues. Uh, we're really talking about mentoring, but nothing in this panel should be construed to provide uh, legal advice. If you have a legal question, uh, please save it for your attorney or uh, let us know where you're located and we'll give you a number for a lawyer referral service. Uh, after the initial presentations, we will have a question and answer session, but you can also throughout the presentation, type in your questions in the, um, the Q&A function that appears in Zoom. And uh, the panelists will address your questions as time permits. And so thank you all for being here and Professor Moran, thank you so much for uh, leading this effort today. Well, thank you very much, Luz. I very much appreciate the kind introduction. And I'm also grateful to a number of people who have made this event possible. Of course, Luz Herrera is one of them, along with Leticia Salcedo, who co-directs the Network for Justice. But I also would be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge Kirsten Evans at Texas A&M, who has been the events coordinator as well as Olivia Countryman, who helped me to identify our wonderful panel of speakers as my research assistant. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dean Robert Adia um, for his support of this event, as well as my own Dean Song Richardson at UCI and Ajay Marotra at the American Bar Foundation. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists, and I'm just going to give you their, their names um, because we will have their bios in the chat function if you want to learn more about them. But we actually have representation from three different leadership training programs. We wanted to include a national program as well as programs from California and Texas because we thought these two states are going to be vital in preparing leadership for the Latinx community. So representing the Hispanic National Bar Association's Latina Leadership Academy are Sulema Medrano Novak, who is a former co-chair of the Latina Commission, as well as Grisel Seco, Vice Chair, Latina Leadership Academy Committee. And she said during our meeting, our pre-meeting, that whatever I said about her, she wanted to be sure everybody knew she was Puerto Rican and raised in the South Bronx. So I got that in there, Grisel. And then next we have the Change Lawyers Program uh, from California. We have Jasjeet Singh, who is the Director of Programs, and we have a program graduate, Eliana Kaimowitz, who works as Immigration Branch Chief for the California Department of Social Services. Finally, we have from Texas, the Mexican American Legislative Leadership Foundation, and we have Irma Reyes, who is the executive director of the Mexican American Legislative Caucus and former director of the Moreno Rangel program. And we also have Tanya Oliva Martinez, who is the current director of the Moreno Rangel program and also is a graduate herself of this program. 
Now, our plan is to let each of the three talk about both the creation of the program and the experience of going through the program. And then we'll have, if time permits, a moderated roundtable with questions. And then we want to make sure to have time for questions from you. And if you do have questions, please put them in our question and answer function. If you submitted questions beforehand, I have those and I will try to include some of those as well. All right, let me turn it over now to Norma and, uh, uh, excuse me, um, Sulema uh, Medrano Novak, who is substituting for Norma Garcia and also Grisel. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everyone, and morning sometime, somewhere, and uh, for those of you attending from the West Coast, um, my name is Sulema Medrano Novak. I'm a partner at Fagri Drinker Biddle and Wreath. I'm the former chair of the Latina Commission, and I'm happy to be here with all of you. So I'll give you a little background on the Latina Leadership Academy um, and, and the commission itself, and then I'll pass it over to Grisette to talk more about the specifics of the program. That way we can split up the conversation for everyone. So the Latina Commission is a group of 25, approximately 25 lawyers from across the country, Latina lawyers from across the country, from in-house corporations, nonprofit, the judicial sector, um, private firms. And we are a commission that was formed over 10 years ago by one of the Hispanic National Bar Association's women, pre women presidents. And one thing she noted was that there wasn't a significant presence of Latinas in certain sectors of the legal community. And she created this commission with, with the, um, the mission and the duty to not only research what the status is of Latinas in certain sectors, but also come up with a plan on how do we increase that visibility and how do we increase um, our pipeline and strengthen our pipeline to get more Latinas interested in not only law, but also certain sectors of the law. So that, that's how the commission was formed. The commission then in turn started a Latina leadership program and academy and has selected, it's grown and grown over the years. In fact, we now do regional, um, regional versions of the program, but the program really is an opportunity for Latina lawyers to have a, a safe space to talk about um, the issues and the barriers that we face in the legal community um, that really prohibit us from staying um, and advancing. And, you know, in fact, this is, I think, a good way for me to segue over to Grisel. Grisel has been a pivotal, a, a pivotal leader in this program. She's helped us develop and refine the programming. And so I think this is really her swan song. And I'm going to ask her to and let her kind of give you more details on what the programming includes um, and, and how we've developed the programming over the years. Thank you, Salama. So let's, um, let me split it. We, what we've done is we've split the mentoring and the programming into two. So anyone who's been practicing from zero to 10 years, they would um, qualify for what we call the Latina Leadership Academy. And we have, to Salama's point, both national programming and regional programming um, across the United States. And what it covers, it's uh, great mindset, negotiation skills, it covers um, executive presence, executive coaching, uh, negotiating salary, negotiating moves. So that is the focus for the uh, younger attorneys, right? Anybody who's been practicing 10 years or less. And then there's a program for 11 years or more, and that's called the executive program. And that really is taking your career to the next level to the, you know, if you're currently in house to go to deputy counsel or a GC role that focuses on strategizing mentality, also negotiation skills, um, networking. There's a big component in networking and board service, how to uh, use the skills that you have now to propel your career to the next level. So we do both uh, programs. I graduated from both, right? So when I was a six year associate at a big law firm, I did the academy and my biggest takeaway from there is don't let your job become your career. Your career you own, right? The job is a space that you're in right now and you do a good job and you run results. 
but you need to look at your life in a career trajectory and understand where you want to be. Uh, because many times myself, I was in, in a big law firm, I would kind of lose my, I would lose my center. I'd be like, oh, I don't have time to go to this networking event, or I can't really attend this lunch. It's a little bit easier now in this COVID world where we can actually attend things virtually, but my biggest takeaway was never forgetting building my professional familia, right? As an, a graduate of the executive, it's a similar concept uh, which flows through. When I was doing networking or when I was uh, creating professional pathways, I always thought if I'm really strategic about reaching out to the CEO or the GC or the partner, Am I going to look like I'm a brown noser? Am I going to look like I'm selling out, right? Like, what does it look like um, to my family, right? If I want to do these things. And really the executive changed my mindset. It's like, look, everybody has a family. And if you take that family and you think, how am I going to create my professional familia? Then what do you do, right? Where's your board? Where's your personal board of directors? Where is your personal trajectory to the career? Um, so really, the academy and the executive are meant to address these issues. Our voice, our imposter syndrome, if we have it. Um, I ask uh, Professor Moran to say that I was born and raised in the South Bronx. It is fundamentally who I am, right? I don't look at social inequity without looking at language inequity or race inequity, and that comes from where I started. Um, so the academy and the executive, which are both free, by the way, super critical piece, um, it's free programming, one one day programming, and some are, are um, six month programming, depending on which, which program you're doing, but it's free and it's helpful and it's there. And in the virtual world, it means that you're committing to at least four hours in one month. If you're doing the academy uh, tomorrow, for example, we're having academies from 12 to 5.30 um, or several months if you're doing the executive. But it's an investment in your own career that is completely free as long as you're a practicing attorney. Um, the academy is only for Latinas. The executive has both male and female. So it's important to kind of know that it runs the gamut, but our focus has been on, on women, in part because we're only 4% of the women in law, right? Which I often say this, and I always will say this, my mere presence in the room is an act of civil rights. So I will turn it back to you, Professor Moran. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And we actually did have a question uh, that was sent in about imposter syndrome. So maybe we can come back to that later and, and how you help people address that, because that actually was raised in one of the questions from our audience before the panel began. Uh, now I wanted to turn to uh, change lawyers, Jasjit Singh and Eliana Kamowitz. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so my name is Jasjit Singh. I'm the director of programs here at California Change Lawyers. I've been here almost three years. Um, I've been in California 99% of my life and I wouldn't have it any other way. So um, I know time's limited. So I'm actually gonna break it down really quickly into like who we are, what we fund and how we support our fellows. Um, and I'll try to keep it relevant to the conversation that we're having. So. Starting with who we are, um, I think we'll start with why we exist. Uh, we exist because there's a breakdown of trust and confidence in the legal system from communities of color. And that lack of trust exists because there's a lack of representation. And um, you just touched on these numbers and I'll throw some more numbers in here, but 40% uh, of California's population, at least according to some of the stuff that I've been reading is uh, identifies as Latinx, but only 7% of the attorneys in California are Latinx. And then uh, the information gets even more grim when you look at um, nationwide, only 2% of attorneys are Latinx women. Um, so you can see dis similar distressing numbers when it comes to the Black, Asian, and Indigenous populations um, across the United States, and especially in California. So we exist as a statewide foundation that empowers the next generation of lawyers, judges, and activists. Uh, we call these change makers uh, change lawyers. Uh, we hope that they will be the ones who right historical wrongs in our courtrooms, classrooms, and beyond. So we were founded in 1989 by the State Bar of California. 
A um, couple of years back, we became an independent organization and then we changed our name to Change Lawyers. So we're working to diversify the legal system, but it's not just about diversity. We're working to build a better system overall. Um, so we fund and support a lot of stuff. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but last year I think our funding um, exceeded uh, like $1.1 million. And I work on our policy grants and scholarships work. So we provide grants to high school programs, college programs and law school level organizations working to increase um, interest in law school, law school enrollment, and then um, also law school success. Um, our 1L and 3L scholarships um, are a really important part of the program. Uh, we work with affinity bar organizations, law firms, and other, um, other entities who are dedicated to our mission statement to co-sponsor scholarships. Um, and, you know, we look at the numbers, we see the data, and our goal is to provide these diversity scholarships to shift the scales in favor of underrepresented communities. So a majority of our scholars identify as female, a very strong majority. Um, over a third identifies LGBTQIA+, and a large majority, I think almost 70% come from Latinx and black backgrounds. And then we also have strong uh, representation from Asi Asian, um, Arab, Middle Eastern and indigenous um, identifying individuals. So we provided 60 scholarships last year. In addition to these scholarships, we also provide them with ongoing training, mentorship and partnerships with bar prep organizations. And I think we've gotten books from the ABA and I thank you ABA, I know they're on here somewhere listening. So, um, so relevant to this, uh, we have ongoing year long and summer long fellowships that fund, that provide funding to organizations who can then hire legal fellows um, at their organizations. Um, our summer fellows are usually second and third year um, students in law school. And then our year long fellows are usually law grads or recently barred attorneys. Currently, we have year-long fellows at Uncommon Law, which is an Oakland-based nonprofit working on prison reform and criminal justice. We also have a year-long fellow at Otro Lado, which is a nonprofit working on immigrant rights um, down at the San Diego-Mexico border. And then in addition to these ongoing programs, we have the type of programs that have funded Eliana, who she can go into the details about her work, but um, these are collaborative funding opportunities that we have. So. Um, thinking about how we support our fellows really quickly. When it comes to our fellows, we don't see ourselves as much of a leadership um, training program as we see ourselves as a job placement training program that adds leadership components to it. Um, so a good example is right now we have um, fellows that we just selected um, for a newly launched immigration legal fellowship program with the state of California um, in partnership with other nonprofits and the Department of Social Services in California. And 90% of our fellows identify as Latinx. Uh, some of the requirements we had was the ability to speak Spanish due to the placements that we're um, putting these folks in. They're being placed around the state of California. Um, they're currently being given intense deportation defense training. Um, we have ongoing leadership training set up for them, including imposter syndrome training. Um, we are setting them up with networking opportunities, career coaching, resume workshops, and then most importantly, we're providing them with strong salaries. Um, oftentimes, immigration attorneys and spaces like this do not provide strong um, salaries, and we're doing that. We recognize that there's no reason for folks of color to come into spaces and not get the salaries that they absolutely deserve. So um, we support them through our networking, our training, and those strong salaries not to just create good attorneys, but to create great leaders who can uh, move our communities towards justice. I hope that was five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. So um, good afternoon or good morning or good, good evening to who, to who all we are speaking to today. My name is Eliana Kamowitz. I am uh, currently uh, the Immigrant Integration Branch Chief uh, at the Department of Social Services, but really I'm here as a change lawyers graduate, as um, you know, a, a, fellow, a fellow attorney and a fellow person who, who needed mentorship along the way and found it in sometimes unexpected places. I do want to begin um, just a little bit sharing, you know, echoing what Jasjeet shared about, you know, the fact that although we are progressive California and, you know, in terms of demographics, our numbers, uh, there are, we have a large uh, Latino 
person of color community, progressive community, uh, that is not necessarily reflected in our legal profession. And so for those of us who are in those spaces, uh, you can sometimes feel very alone, very isolated, and like it's not clear where, where you are going. So I want to share just a little bit um, about how I heard about this fellowship program. So I was a, let's say, a mid-career fellow. Um, I had been out of law school already for eight years, and the person who shared uh, the information about this fellowship with me was a an alum from my law school. So she and I had gone to Penn Law School together on the East Coast. She knew about my interest in immigration. She knew that I was a bit lost as a lawyer because I couldn't quite find a place that worked for me, having uh, been at a big law firm, worked at a, non, a small nonprofit, and then worked internationally on human rights work. And, um, you know, it was perfect timing, but I think one of the takeaways for me is that really mentoring begins um, at the peer level, right? When you are in law school and, and the friends you make and the people who are your support network, they become uh, key throughout the rest of your career as everybody kind of goes their own way um, to kind of looking out for each other and, and supporting each other in the different career choices that, that you make. So. I was able to learn about this fellowship. It was at a good time when California was really looking into a way to bring immigration into um, state government, right? Immigration is often thought of as a federal job, as something that the feds do, or you're an immigration attorney, those are the options. So this was bringing an opportunity to work on law and policy at the state level. And it was a very unique opportunity. I really, really appreciated it. It is really what allowed um, both, I think, the state government of California to see the value of having a, a lawyer, having someone who had experience being from the Latin community, being from uh, an immigrant community, um, work directly on these issues. One of the things I have um, tried to express to my fellow government attorneys is that in order to solve things, you have to know the community that you're solving for and know what the daily situation is that people experience. And that's really important when you're in higher level policy positions and trying to find solutions for people. What does it actually look like on the ground? What does that community actually want? What, what are the things that, you know, uh, my experiences representing clients and being from the community um, bring to the table? So, um, so that, that is one takeaway. I think the other thing I want to, I want to share is that, you know, for me, again, this was a mid career ship opportunity. I had already been in many different spaces um, and it really reminded me of all the ways in which you can use your legal degree, right? I think that's another thing that mentors remind you is that law school wasn't a waste. You know, there are so many things that you learned along the way. Um, maybe you're not litigating, maybe you're not directly representing clients, but your le legal skills can be put to great use in a variety of settings. And um, in this particular instance, the fellowship really focused on analyzing legislation and tracking federal policy and litigation related to immigration law, which... <laughs> which was a very, very hot issue at the time. And you needed definitely an understanding of, of law and policy to be able to adequately tell the governor what was happening on DACA, what was happening on uh, changes at the border or changes um, in many different spaces. And so I, I just, that's another kind of reminder here as we're talking about mentorship. I think people along the way can, can uh, remind you that all the things that you did learn in law school, all, all the reasons you went to law school, there, there's lots of different ways to, to use that. Um, I think, you know, the, the program did so many things for me. I think one of the really important things for, for a legal fellowship program for me as a mid-career fellow was it gave me the opportunity to mentor others, right? So I think that's another piece of mentoring that I was in cohorts sometimes with, with people who were just out of law school. I had been, you know, I was an old lady by then. I had I have kids. I have I navigated work, work life balance issues. I've navigated high pressure jobs. There was just a lot of things about being the only person of color in the room, had navigated that as well. All of those things that I could speak to for some of the younger folks that I was working with who were in my cohort of legal fellows. And I think that was, you know, that's another kind of reminder about this mentorship thing, which is that it's not just about where can you find a mentor, but how can you be a mentor, even as a peer? Um, I think the other thing that it was invaluable to me is that I ended up um, working both in the governor's office and then later finishing my fellowship at the Department of Social Services, 
where I found a mentor who was another uh, female Latina attorney uh, who was of my age and we both agreed to mentor each other, right? As we walked through many difficult spaces and we, we dealt with, with many difficult things being, <laughs> being the only ones in the room. So I, I just, I think one of the takeaways for me here is that, you know, mentoring is an ongoing continuum. It's a process. You find fellow peers as mentors when you're in law school, uh, you can find support in many different ways, um, but that we should all be looking out for opportunities, not just to, to find those people who can remind us of, of our value, our skills and our importance, but also to make sure that we are sharing that with others, whether it is people who are coming behind the future generation or, you know, as, as young attorneys with your peers, because again, that network for me has been really, really important. Um, I think, you know, I love the way that <clears throat> that Change Lawyers talks about, you know, the importance of, of building community um, amongst legal professionals. I think the way we talk about, um, you know, what a career means, a place where you can stay for a long time and have an impact, and the fact that they're supporting both, you know, hi from high school students to mid-career people. Again, I think just that idea of the continuum of fellowship is really important, and that, um, you know, social change is, is, is just important for for us to be able to advance all the goals we want to, and for it not to be, uh, for us not to be the only ones in the room in the future, um, for there to be really a change in the structure of many of our institutions and many of our um, legal spaces, so that you know both the law and the policy and the people doing the work are really reflective of the needs and the populations that we serve. So thank you very much for this opportunity today. Well, thank you so much to Change Lawyers for those comments, uh, Jasjeet and Eliana. And now we want to turn to the Mexican-American uh, Legislative Leadership Foundation, Irma Reyes and Tanya Oliva um, uh, Martinez. Thank you so much, Professor Moran. Um, my name is Irma Reyes. I am the caucus director at the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus. We are the oldest and largest Latino legislative caucus in the country, um, older and larger than California's legislative caucus, as well as the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. I also um, had the privilege of serving as the program director for the Moreno Rangel Legislative Leadership Program in 2019. And shortly you'll hear from Dania Oliva, who is the current program director and an alumni of the 2019 class. Um, the, Moren, the Mexican American Legislative Leadership Foundation is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization committed to fostering the development of leadership skills among Latino youth. The foundation was established by the Mexican American Legislative Caucus, MALC, to encourage Latino youth to engage in the political process and further this, this goal by sponsoring the Moreno Rangel Legislative Leadership Program in 2003. And it's really neat to see, um, let me see here, Chris Pineda is joining us and he was actually the first program director back in uh, 2003. So thank you, Chris, for joining us. And just a little bit about the program, the Moreno Rangel Legislative Leadership Program is named in honor of the longest serving Hispanic member of the Texas House of Representatives, Paul C. Moreno from El Paso, and the first Mexican-American woman to serve in the Texas legislature, the late Irma Rangel from Kingsville. Um, we commonly refer to Moreno Rangel leadership fellows as MELF fellows. The selection process for the Moreno Rangel program has become more vigorous throughout the years. Now, applicants go through a two-interview process after submitting their application, and MALC staff reviews their qualifications. Following the two interviews, fellows are selected by focusing on their background, policy interests, geographical location, and career aspirations. This allows for the best experience fellows can have during the program. For example, if an applicant that has deep roots in Houston with a background in immigration advocacy will likely get placed in a MALC member's office from that region that has championed those efforts. The leadership program offers Latinx undergraduate and graduate students the opportunity to gain firsthand real experience in the functions and operations of the Texas House of Representatives during a legislative session. 
for those out-of-staters joining us today, um, the Texas legislature meets for 180 days every odd number year. Participants learn how state government works and interacts with the public and become better equipped to serve the communities they represent. Mal Fellows worked full-time in Austin, Texas for the entire duration of the legislative session in a MALC member's office. Fellows work alongside experienced legislative staff and participate in weekly sem seminars where they will interact with other program participants, Latino leaders, elected officials, and state agency representatives. In addition to learning the legislative process and developing their leadership skills, MAL fellows receive a monthly stipend to assist with living expenses. At the Texas Capitol, careers routinely develop from unpaid, unpaid internships with many legislators having served as interns, fellows, or staffers before running for office. At MAL, we know that unpaid internships should not be the norm. And since the program's incep inception, a monthly stipend has always been provided to fellows. Following MAL's lead, many fellowship programs have surfaced for the Texas legislature and the majority of them are paid. This is essential for recruiting quality participants and compensating full-time staff work so that fellows can pursue a career in this field without having to suffer economic hardship like an internship, like an unpaid internship could cause. The really neat thing about the MALF program is not only do we offer Latinx students the opportunity to get their foot in the door at the Texas Capitol, but we also provide a rigorous orientation where we dive into the legislative process. Throughout the fellowship, the program director serves as a mentor to all the fellows. I still speak and am very close to the former class, um, which I was a program director for the 2019 class. And in addition to this, the weekly seminars provide valuable resources in not only leadership, but also key meetings with stakeholders like state agencies and advocacy groups to further fellows policy knowledge on issues important to the legislature. We're proud to announce that the 2021 class of Moreno Rangel Fellows is the largest in the program's history with 20 legislative fellows working full-time in a MALC member's office during the 87th legislature. And I'll kick it on over to Ms. Tanya Oliva to share her experience as an alumni and as a current program director for the Moreno Rangel Legislative Leadership Program. Hi, everybody. Uh, to all of those who are watching and who are joining this important conversation, my name is Tanya and I, uh, like Irma said, I am a Moreno Rangel program graduate and this year's program director. And I'd like to share just a little bit about my experience as an alumni and how that has framed the way I'm running the program this year. But uh, before that, I just really, since this is a conversation about training the next generation, I just wanted to highlight that it's people like Irma who are just doing this work daily. Uh, she has been a great mentor to me uh, personally. And I know, and I've seen how she mentors other Latinx students who are very passionate uh, about public service. And so she touched a little bit about um, the benefit or, uh, that the program offers a stipend, right? And so I'm sure many of you watching have had to work a couple of jobs and study at the same time. Um, at least that was my experience. And that often becomes a barrier to advancing in your career and your education, just because when that's your reality, there's less opportunities for you to have an internship where you're learning and working in areas that you're passionate about. And so for me, the Moreno Rangel Legislative Leadership Program provided me with that exact opportunity. Uh, the way I initially found out about the, I first found out about the Mexican American Legislative Caucus through a friend who worked at the Texas Capitol. Um, she actually interned for one of our Malcolm members and she told me that, you know, she was like, the caucus works on all the social justice issues that you're passionate about. And so I was like, after um, interning with them for a few months, I found, I learned about the program and I applied and then I, I stayed, so the fellows are, like Irma said, they're assigned to different MALC member offices. And so I, uh, I wanted to stay with the caucus. So I was a MALC fellow at the caucus. And I was just really excited about the program because 
it was a perfect opportunity to gain legislative experience. It was my time there was during the 86th legislative session and now we're in the 87th legislative session. So it was in 2019. And, you know, to also be able to work on issues that, that I'm passionate about and that I know that the fellows shared those same passions, you know, and, and Irma Reyes and Jacqueline Uresti, like they are super strong Latinas who have been in the fight for, for so long. And so we're all getting the chance and the opportunity to learn from them. And so I had just graduated that December of 2018 from college. And so coming out of college, it was just a, a very, just like a true blessing not to, not only like to be able to have an income that allowed me to pay my bills, but to be part of a historic program. And like, it's, like I said, um, learn from a, a team run by strong Latinas who really put people and equity at the center of policy and governance. And so this program really is an opportunity for Latinx youth to have those same job opportunities as other people have, right? To work in public service and to be part of that decision-making process because we offer our unique experiences offer that that um that view that has to be there like how, when we're making uh crafting legislation and we're when the legislation is being you know it's passing through the legislative process and so it matters and um in my class there were 15 other fellows um and 16 with me and so it was like Irma said this 2021 class is the largest class yet and so we um I always say that this fellowship really has changed my life completely. And uh, I, I know Irma has heard me say this, but I'm, a, I'm an immigrant from Mexico and I wasn't very familiar with just like the opportunities here to thrive. And I just never imagined to be where I am today. And I just think that it's programs like the ones being highlighted here and like their directors, their supporters and participants who make it all possible. And so I just um, want to share a couple of aspects of the program that were helpful in preparing me and my colleagues to be leaders and instruments of social change. Like Irma said, we have a weekly speaker series and the guests were ranging from elected officials, community leaders, reporters, and there was also a lot of experts on different policy areas. And something that I always really admired was the effort from the program um, directors that from from Irma and the team that always ensuring that we're highlighting and learning from diverse voices. So and we're including people of color and women who are leaders in those issues and efforts um, here in Texas. And so the relationships that we build, my 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 um, my peers and I during that session, they those are tools that we still continue to use. I can tell you that because of these relationships and these resources and opportunities that came from the program, um, people in my class have become campaign managers. They've gone to law school, grad school, they're policy directors, they in, in different organizations, they're chiefs of staffs, organizers, leaders in our communities. And others are, you know, very passionate about running for office. And so this program, is just amazing and I'm really excited to see all the great things that our class of that our 2021 class of fellows are going to do during the 87 legislative session and also beyond uh, and I know that one of our current mouth fellows Lorraine Garcia she's a law student at AM. she's watching us so I just wanted to uh, give her a shout out and yeah so just Tell everybody you know about this amazing program that runs every Texas legislative session. And thank you so much for listening. And Professor Moran, I'll hand it to you. Yeah, I know you wanted to share the photo of the Oh, of the yes. Class. Did you Let still me... want to do that just so everybody can see the, the cohort? I do. I don't know if you can all see it now, but that is that was our class of 2019. And then, um, hopefully soon we'll have one what you know due to the COVID restrictions but we hope to have one of the class of 2021. <laughs> yeah thank you so much for sharing that it kind of brings it all to life with the photo. Well I wanted to go ahead and um, 
start with a question about the, I mean, we, you know, I mentioned Olivia Countryman, my research assistant, and she worked very hard to find leadership training opportunities. And it turns out there are not that many out there for the Latinx community. Do you have thoughts about why there are relatively few programs and what might be done to increase the opportunities? How about, um, well, you can start in any order, but just to get us off, what about Sulema? Yeah, so there's a lot of professionals that spend their careers uh, leading these conversations and conducting these leadership uh, programs. And I apologize that the lighting in my office is, is kind of reflecting on my face. So what we found, um, the Latina Commission has found, is that it can be expensive. And so I think that's why there is the limitation, because the hope is to extend this programming for free to our students who need it, to our pipeline, um, to our younger professionals, and even at the executive level, it, it, it's, it's expensive. So we've been trying to find um, sponsorships. Um, in fact, what Crisel has done and, and other volunteers has done is they have learned the material and and train other Latinas on how, and other attorneys on how to present the materials. So we've all learned how to present the materials. In fact, an expectation of the commissioners was, and, and not everyone, because not everyone is comfortable getting in front of a group and, 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 and taking the lead on presenting these kind of hard topics. But for those of us who, who are up for the task and able to, one of the goals has been to train them so that we can expand this type of training programming and to do it in a more condensed manner in the regional and different regions. So we're a national organization. We um, host this one day Latina Leadership Academy at the annual conference. In fact, Griselles and Norma have rolled it out to do it at the mid-year conference. So now we have it twice and it's a, generally a full day um, now with it being virtual, the structure is a little different. The executive program that focuses on some of the harder issues that happen when you hit your ceiling in your organization, that has been a longer program, a six month program. Now, again, for example, that particular program, that's expensive because we've hired an executive coach. We actually have three executive coaches that break out, not only do the group programming, but they also break out and have individual sessions. And so we had to find a sponsor. Um, and so a lot of the programming has either been through sponsorship of companies of similar like or similar organizations um, or individuals who want to expand the leadership programming um, or through volunteers who have learned the programming and are, are willing to reproduce it. Um, so that's how we've been able to maintain and expand the programming. And unfortunately, I do think that cost is is one of the barriers. Would anyone like to add any additional thoughts on that question? It's also about, about, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I mean, I, you know, it's also about, um, I think there's a cultural uh, portion to that or perspective, right? Like as a Latina, if I, as a Latina born and raised in South Bronx, right? If I am making big law money, then I should be helping my family. Then I should be doing, you know, giving back there's almost a sense of selfishness that I had to uh, contend with, right? Is it okay to invest in me if I have a two-year-old? I now have a 12-year-old, but at the time, right? Was it okay to invest in me? Was it okay not to pay for another computer for one of my cousins, but to take that $2,000 invested in myself so that ultimately I can pay for a computer for five cousins, right? Because it would help my career grow. Um, so there's a socioeconomic aspect as well as a cultural aspect to spending the kinds of money that leadership organiz you know, leadership uh, coaching requires. But when you think about people in the C-suite usually have executive coaches assigned to them by big corporations, it, it is an investment, right? An investment in career. Sorry, Eliana, I didn't mean to cut you off. No problem. No, I, um, just piggybacking off of that a bit. I think that um, the other aspect of it is if, if you assume that you're going to have uh, a leadership space, right, you would want to see other 
other Latinas there. You would want to see other kind of people who have had a similar experience than you have, that you've had, right? They're kind of being able to speak to your experience. And I think that, first of all, the numbers are not high. There are not that many people who have had all of these experiences. And those same people um, are being asked to do a number of things as the only ones, right? Like they are asked to be speaking about their experience as the only Latina in something. They are being asked to uh, speak as the only, you know, person of color at their firm or as the, the longest being leader of their nonprofit. And, you know, in many different spaces, people are asking them for their time because they are the only ones in those representing those spaces. And so those same folks are then asked to rep to mentor others or to provide, uh, you know, uh, direction or, 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 or share in these spaces of leadership. So I think part of it is kind of the, the, the fact that there are so few. Uh, folks and, and and people have a lot of other time commitments, right? If if you're if you're high up in an organization, it's because you have a, a more than full time job, and you have your two year old, and you have your twelve year old, and you have you know the time that you want to be able to spend for yourself so that you can you know balance all of these things. So I think you know part of it is uh, to me, I, I, I've still always found it helpful to be in leadership spaces where. Perhaps, you know, it is it's not a fellow Latina, but it's, it's a black man who's experienced many things that, you know, I, I can find uh, similarities in, or it's a, it's a fellow uh, woman who has also experienced the work-life balance. I think, I think part of it is just not assuming that our leadership spaces have to necessarily look like us until we have those numbers. <laughs> Okay, um, if no one else wants to add to that one, any answers or thoughts, I wanted to move to another question that was submitted by one of the audience before we had our session, and that relates to this problem of imposter syndrome. And I know that came up in some of the comments at the beginning of our uh, presentations. And the, the question really is about how do you deal with that feeling of being an imposter? This actually builds a little bit on the, the sense of the lack of diversity, the exceptionalism in the space, and, and then feeling like, do I actually belong in this space? So how do your programs address that, if at all? Um, so I, I'll, I'll just go real quick. Um, I actually had talked about some of the webinars that we've done. It actually links back to what um, the previous conversation. So I'm actually going to put the link in here. Um, it's the California Leaders Summit.org. Um, we actually have a bunch of webinars, um, one including how to beat imposter syndrome. Um, I think that's in there. Um, another one is how to confront microaggressions, um, how to um, self care and healing, um, you know networking for introverts. There's a lot of stuff in here that I feel like we created based off the feedback we got from our scholars and fellows. Like, we need to hear about this. We don't know how to deal with this. And it goes back to also a cost thing. Like, of course, we can't do that for every single person, but this is a free resource that anyone can click on um, and hopefully take away from it um, some level of like learning or understanding that could help them. So I'm just throwing that in there uh, in terms of what we specifically do. And, and it's that access is to anyone, including any of us on the panel or any single person around the world who wants to watch. So some of the data that we collected is, uh, through the commission's efforts has shown that a lot of folks who have identified as um, experiencing imposter syndrome a lot of times are the first in their families to go to school or to be in that space. Um, and oftentimes develop it because they feel like they're the only. So it's like this idea of I'm the only. And so because I, I'm not like them, then maybe I'm not supposed to be here because I stand out. So some of our, a lot of our programming focuses on identifying some of the, the cultural differences, but also um, uh, training and coaching on how to maximize those as qualities and uh, deficiencies and also putting, particularly we find that imposter syndrome was, you know, cultural, being Latina and being our gender, right? So we, it's a double, it's a double whammy. And so the programming is really trying to put folks that look like you, women who look like you and have similar experiences in a room and talk about these issues because then you're no longer the only. And that builds confidence. So the data has shown that 
when you're in a classroom with people who look more like you, you're in a setting with people who look more like you, that you feel like you belong and that builds confidence. So trying to build that confidence on not only putting them in that room and in that setting, hearing other people's experiencing, knowing they're not alone and they're not the only. And then um, also training on how, you know, a lot of, a lot of times what we find is there these commonalities, these common traits among us, grit, you know, hard work, um, you know, resilience, that these things are what makes you who you are and what gets you to where you're at. Like you, you, it's not luck. You know, that a lot of that is part of the imposter syndrome. I mean, I'm lucky I got here by luck. Um, and in fact, you hear that in our community too. I can't tell you how many times my family has told me how lucky I am. And I think, well, the difference between you and I is nothing more than hard work you know, that I put in the time. And so again, just, you know, breaking down cultural barriers, sometimes it's not just the other, it's not the majority who makes us feel that way, but it's, it's sometimes within our own culture that, that can create that imposter syndrome. Um, and Grisel instructs on this all the time. So I'm sure she could add a few things uh, to help with that. Oh, jeez. I completely agree. Um, so my, one of the things I always talk about is fear, right? It's false evidence appearing real. So it's your own fear. Imposter syndrome is your own fear of being present of not belonging. And the reality is you've earned the space. You've earned your space at the table. No one in big law, no one in big corporations, no one in nonprofit will hire somebody that they don't think is good enough, right? We hire people who we know are good enough. Law schools admit students they know that are good enough. They don't think, oh, Latina, so let's just admit her. No, right? Corporations don't think, oh, Latina, so let's give her an in-house counsel role. Um, so it is about facing our realities vis-a-vis -vis our fear, right? The reality is no one gets a job for free. Um, you earn it. The reality is no one gets admitted to law school without having gone through the application process, the LSAT, the blah, 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 blahs, right? You've earned it. So I always um, invert the word fear and ask people to look at what that R is. Have you driven results in your life and in your career? And if so, then your place in that space is your reality and shouldn't be your fear. Okay, we actually have another question from the audience, and this is from Chris, who was uh, previously an executive director, and he was so happy to hear about the placements and the long-term trajectories of people who go through the program. And what he was wondering is, how do you keep count, you know, sort of keep track of everybody um, who goes through your programs? And then how do you try to make sure they continue to stay in touch with each other? For example, Tanya had said how important it was to stay in touch with members of her cohort. How do you facilitate that kind of ongoing connection across the various graduates of your programs? Yeah. Uh, so, oh, Tanya, you can go ahead. I'll let you in the note. Okay. Yeah, it's been, uh, we, routinely stay in contact with our former classes, especially the most recent ones. So anytime that there's a job opportunity that we know of, there's a volunteer opportunity that we know of, or just general check-ins, we do keep in close contact. I just talked to a 2019 cohort fellow just this morning, um, but as a more broader alumni class. We have been looking at ways on how to have a big group either online, um, well, online for now, um, with all of the cohorts um, dating back to 2003. So Chris, we'll be reaching out to you um, soon on that. But it's been a work in progress that we wanted to connect with all of the Moreno Rangel fellows so we could highlight their achievements and also connect them to current Moreno Rangel fellows. So that way they can learn off of their experiences, even if they were two decades ago, but they're still very valuable and um, helpful now in, in their experience. Yeah, and I just wanted to go back to the last question really quickly, just 
Because uh, that's why representation matters so much, right? I, I was remembering of a conversation I actually had with, with my, my peers um, and we were talking exactly about imposter syndrome and we were saying like, and I think in the conversation, we, we were all like, wow, you feel it too. And then it, it was kind of that, com- you know, those shared experiences and, and just by having a class, you know, where, when, where you can have those conversations and then looking at who's, who are being the leaders of those programs. And then I look at Irma and then I look at Jackie and, and, you know, then you, you start um, having those experiences that then change that, that, that thought in your mind, you know, that, that was wrong because then you start seeing it and then believing it for yourself and then trying to, uh, uplift other peers as well, other uh, Latinx students, right? And so that's why uh, whenever we talk about also how we all stay connected, like we, you develop friendships, right? You develop these relationships with each other. And then when you find, oh, there's this job opportunity, then we, you know, we text each other, we create groups. Uh, I know like the current class of fellows have a group me uh, where they are constantly talking and sharing and I had one for my class you know and and we still all um we talk and then we we share about the different opportunities that we have and then during orientation we also had we invited former fellows like Irma said to sort of um be mentors for our current fellows as well and see like what are the things that um you know, looking at what things do people do after this program? Because this program is, you know, maybe a first step, a second step, but like the careers continue, right? And then you are able to see how much of an impact that program has had for for many people. Um, So that's how we stay connected and we track, we love spreadsheets. So we track, we (laughs) can save people's contact information and and try to keep them as involved and engaged in our social media and any events that we hold. And yeah. Well, this is terrific. We're coming towards the end of our time together. So I wanted to have a speed round with everybody. And it's just like a one sentence, your best piece of advice for people who are thinking about how to, you know, make these transitions, become leaders within their fields. So uh, I know it's hard, but just really quick. So everybody gets to give us one of their, their best advice in a quick sentence. I, and I know that's very difficult. Maybe it's an unrealistic exercise, but try your best. Um, and so we'll start with uh, Sulema and Grisel. I, my best piece of advice and what has helped me tremendously is really networking. Um, you know, taking that time, it, it is a lot of time investment, but I would say that networking is extremely important to learn about opportunities, whether it's training, job, personal, um, and that, you know, just trying to identify those organizations that provide those opportunities to network. Okay, great. Grisel? I would say, um, you know, leadership is knowing your heart. Know what brings you passion, because that flows and will provide you everything that you might need, right? It'll provide you looking for the networks, to Sulema's point, it will provide you with the executive presence that you're going to need because your passion and your purpose come across completely different from anything else. So um, do a self-assessment. Remember why you went to law school. Mm -hmm. Remember it, write it down, uh, put it away and bring it, bring that journal entry back Mm -hmm. out when life happens. Okay. How about Jasjeet and Eliana? Uh, They already took the good answers. So, (laughs) You know, for, I guess, thinking, um, I'd say seek out folks, um, just more specifically about networking, actually see who you, who really inspires you and just reach out to them. I think social media and like the way LinkedIn works. um, I mean, anyone, if anyone wants to add me on LinkedIn, feel free. I'm happy to help. Um, Just getting connected with folks in that sense, just like feel confident to actually reach out to someone. I think um, we really need to be confident and just know that we we belong here and that we should reach out to anyone and hopefully that person responds. <laughs> hey, Eliana. 
I would say it's uh, never too late to find a mentor and it's never too late to be a mentor. I think both of those things are true and, and you may need different mentors for different things, right? And at different points in life. And so um, don't don't stop looking just because the ready-made group wasn't there for you either in law school or at your law firm or at your organization. Um, there's always opportunities to find people um, to talk to to give you good advice and and for you to do that for others as well as you as you start accumulating. Okay, Irma and Tanya, and we're at a eleven. We're at the at the one o'clock mark, so we have to be really succinct. But I do want to hear from you. I'll add that um, if there's a specific area in the law or policy that you are interested in and passionate about, become an expert in that area, because there's nothing more valuable than an expert in a certain policy area in any field. Um, that's, those are my two cents. And Tanya? Um, I, I just really quickly, I think we're constantly learning and growing, right? And so I would say just something I try to do also is continue to challenge myself and like, don't limit yourself by, um, any sort of social constructions or past experiences and also um, sharing resources with others because you never know how it's gonna impact someone else's life and career, so. Okay, great. So with that, I wanted to turn it over to Luz to have the last word. Yes, thank you so much for this uh, great presentation and conversation and particularly thank you to Professor Rachel Moran for organizing this and to Olivia Countryman who helped her. Um, uh, those of you who are interested, please come back for our next three webinars, which again, the next one is uh, the 25th of March, and then every other week since then, you, you, we're sharing the information there. You will find the recording of this webinar and other previous webinars uh, on tamulawanswers.info. So we hope you join us. I've also in the chat put in a, a pitch for you all to join our Network for Justice online platform because that's a great way for us to continue the conversation and to be connected. So thank you so much and we'll see you in two weeks.